midwife care. Oh, th thanks, Katrina. How are you? Hello. Good oh, evening. Sorry. Hello. Thanks very much. So thanks. I'm running a few miles behind. That's OK. Hopefully that's I won't take too too long. I, I was only prepared for about 10 minutes, so hopefully that's as long as I'll take with you. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, I'm Katrina Biscan. I'm a social worker um, with, this, with the local health district. Uh, my substantive position being in intensive care and cardiology. And I'm just currently seconded to um, a project to write a submission with regards to enhancing end of life care um, on the coast. So I'll just sort of quickly just revise what what that was, what that's about, and then. Um, uh, let you know what sort of feedback that I have received already from some GPs on the coast and then just um, invite sort of further comments. So the Ministry of Health announced uh, $743 million of um, enhancement monies um, in June last year. Um, and as and from that, um, we're nearly at the point end of finalising a submission to um, look at um, I suppose what if we were given enhancements, how, how that that would be utilised. So over the last few weeks, I've engaged with about 45 uh, different stakeholder groups. Um, so I have quite a comprehensive um, idea of um, some of the needs that have been identified and we've come up with quite a few um, good initiatives. So I did receive some feedback from um, a handful of, of GPs and I thank those that did um, provide that feedback. Um, so just in quick summary, um, some of the feedback that I received, I'm just going to read it off, um, is that um, there were some concerns um, with regards to, I suppose, the limitations and capacity of um, GPs to um, attend home visits. I know that um, obviously GPs are, um, you know, they're not in, in high numbers. Um, and so you are all spreading yourself quite thin. Um, but or to, to sort of um, be able to, to make home visits, it, it adds another extra burden there. Um, often uh, one of the comments was about sometimes the travel time associated with having to do home visits. Um, and also um, sometimes the lack of remuneration around um, providing that service um, to clients. Um, so, some of the needs that were identified from the comments that I received um, were that there's a need for education and ongoing education and case discussion forums to upskill um, regarding the um, management of palliative care. I'm un under the understanding that, yes, even though palliative care um, needs are quite high, it doesn't necessarily mean that at, at any one time you are managing um, a, a, a large number of palliative care patients, so you might only have the sort of really involved with with a few at a time rather than um, mm. quite a few. Um, so sort of to 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 maintain that um, education, upskilling, and knowledge, um, and have those discussions m might be quite worthwhile. Um, I think another comment was around ensuring the availability of an after hours service. And um, I mean, obviously, at the moment, there is an after hours helpline available, which has been moved to Health Direct. And um, part of our um, one of our initiatives is to move towards planning for a local um, um, service. But that might that that won't happen. Um, um, I think it, uh, it's not immediately. It's, it's sort of planned for um, the future that the funding increments over five years. So some of our um, initiatives are being staggered back through those five years. And one of the other big issues was um, access to medications for patients, given that sometimes you are doing after hours visitors visiting and perhaps sometimes then they might not have access to a pharmacy. Um, so they were the big issues um, that were identified from the feedback that I received. Um, and I was just, I suppose I just wanted to use a short amount of time this evening to um, just get your thoughts about whether there was any other feedback around some of the challenges um, that you face as GPs providing palliative care. Um, and also, um, I suppose, what, what your thoughts might be about how they can be overcome. I suppose before I head into that, I suppose one of the big things 
was also the acknowledgement that GPs do um, care for the patient, the residents of residential aged care facilities, um, and and that of course is, is a huge number, and and they obviously also face um, specific um, um, challenges. So, uh, were there any comments or or or, or challenges that you've perhaps encountered beyond what I've um, sort of outlined from my responses that I received? I think um, I think majority of so I do a lot of nursing homes, so I do a lot of the, the palliative care in nursing home kind of situations, and I think all of that really applies there. But the problem becomes is even as a GP, there's a real discourse. I don't even know if there's a solution to this, but there's a real kind of lack of communication between GP, nursing home and palliative care. And I feel like there's too many parties involved. Um, nurse practitioners and nursing homes will often make referrals or ask for referrals, but you know, somewhere along the line, communication gets lost. Um, so if there's some way of kind of reducing that gap of communication, for example, palliative care, being able to communicate directly with the doctor or more education at nursing homes as well, because I feel like I go to the nursing homes, I tell them things and I can prescribe medications, but then the actual palliative care is done majority, you know, mainly by nursing staff with the with the regular care um, for the patients. And unfortunately, no matter what I prescribe, there's a real lack of when, how to manage the syringe driver, how much medication to give, pressure sore care, you know, all those basic needs that are needed. So I don't know if there's a way of kind of, I don't know if everyone else struggles with that too. Yeah, and I think um, and I believe that um, that that has been picked up also from um, the, the with Elsie Mari, who does do work into residential aged care. She has um, flagged that as a concern as well, which I probably need to link back to yours. But thank you for that. I will certainly will, I will actually add that to my needs analysis tomorrow. And, and also, um, Getting back to your questionnaire uh, and discussing the possibility of shared care arrangements with palliative care, which uh, mm -hmm. might be a way of imp improving communication uh, between the, the three or four stakeholders involved in each patient. Yeah, yeah and it sounds like, um, you know, that communication is a really big um, thing across um, the delivery of palliative care services. And I and I know and I I sort of had jotted down um, some of the sort of overarching themes that I've sort of gathered from speaking to stakeholders, and I, I have noted that um, communication across the the district um, with community service and primary care providers is paramount, and that we really need to work to ensure that um, instead of all being sort of quite distinct spokes, that we actually come together and provide a. a a well-oiled machine, so to speak. So trying to to overcome sort of areas where there are, are, are fall bounds in communication. Not quite sure what the solution is, but it certainly is um, has been flagged that communication and it, it does fall down as 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 clients patients um, transfer across sort of settings. Sorry, and just to add to that, um, I often also find like. I'm happy to do a lot of the palliative care stuff. I'm comfortable prescribing medications and things like that. But then every now and then you reach a patient who's a bit more difficult and I'm just not being able to, whether it's because of the chronic kidney disease, I feel a bit unclear of the medication side. But if there was some way I could do a lot of, like I could support the palliative care team by taking a lot of the work off them as well. If there was some kind of way of communicating where they could give me advice um, and it's easier access to get that advice. Because most of these okay. patients I'm seeing after hours. Um, at nursing homes. So if there's some way like a, you know, a quick way to even get on the phone call with somebody and say, hey, just quickly, this is a situation, you know, is there a recommendation for certain medications or do you have any quick recommendations? Um, that might actually help a lot because I'm there at seven o'clock at night and it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I know that as a, um, a district, we're looking at a, a, a dedicated palliative care pharmacist, I, um, and I'm not quite sure whether that would part of that. I, I don't know that part of that role is to liaise with GPs, but certainly I think um, taking on board that, as you say, a lot of your um, visits perhaps are after hours. And how do you get that advice that you need? Yeah, 
yeah. Yeah, and um, I don't have a clear answer on that one. Because <laughs> if you don't, I definitely don't. <laughs> yeah. So any other thoughts? Oh, and just to keep the, uh, I guess, the uh, mandatory, I guess, to, I guess to make it more not mandatory such with other stakeholders, the police and the ambulance and, and, and the funeral homes in the community. Sometimes uh, I find I get caught because, uh, um, you know, one of the forms hasn't been completed and, um, you know, the, the cops get called and they're calling in the middle of the night and saying, well, look, we, we need this certificate. Um, are you going to be able to do it or not? Yeah. OK, so is that patients that palliative care have been involved with or that you're managing um, yourself? Uh, either way, sometimes I'm managing myself and uh, and uh, just just little, little, little misses, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's palliative care and um, I guess things can decline fairly quickly sometimes mm. before these forms are put in place. Lovely. OK, because I know um, I, I, I my understanding would is that if palliative care are involved, that they do hopefully um, provide information about what needs to be done. And, and, and yeah, um, I, but as I, you say, there, there are gaps. Yeah, pal palliative care advice is, is usually good, but I think uh, what Jazz was indicating is the problem is sometimes the timeliness of that advice. Yeah. You communicate with palliative care, palliative care communicates back with you, but there can be a matter of days where you know, you're looking at hours to be preferable. Okay, so it could be. So so what I'm hearing is that sometimes you reach out for palliative care input, but you might not actually get sort of some contact until some time later, which isn't timely. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, say, why I had one that um, was deteriorating, that palliative care was managing. They were deteriorating on the Friday and they just faxed my office and I looked at it, but it wasn't obvious that the patient was expected to die over the weekend. And they must have asked if I was prepared to, like there was some form or something they wanted me to fill out. And Pal Care had the nurse's number from memory and Pal Care told um, the patient at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night that I'd visit them in the morning and take over and certify the death. <laughs> and I had no notice of this, no information about this, no communication, no nothing. And it was just like, hey, and I'm getting phone calls from the family saying the body's been here for 12 hours. Why aren't you here? So yeah. it's kind of, yeah, not great. Yeah, so that's that's something that was um, mentioned um, at the beginning of the discussion about the, the sometimes the lack of communication between power care and GPs. Yeah. 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 OK. There certainly are um, a lot of gaps and, and I mean, hopefully some of our um, initiatives might go a little way to um, um, addressing some of them, maybe not overcoming them, um, but certainly um, it's something to build on over the next, um, some of the initiatives over the next few years. Yeah. So are there any other questions before I head off and, and uh, let you get on with it? Sounds not perhaps. Okay. Thank you. Kajal. Okay. Well, thank 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 you for talking with me this evening. It's been great actually to get a few more um, thoughts from 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 you all, um, and certainly um, identified some gaps that certainly um, um, 